15. The new information Jebediah's former landlord had provided took my thoughts back to Bethany, Delany's cousin. She'd been found dead in the desert. Had she been trafficked? Was he running some type of isolated brothel? Back in my motel room, I pulled out the copy of the report on Bethany's death McAllister gave me. Her cause of death was undetermined, but the state of Bethany's body suggested she had been kept and possibly tortured. Of course, being out in the desert for an extended amount of time would cause similar effects, but now that I knew Jebediah had pimped women, I couldn't help but wonder if something more nefarious had happened. Bethany had been emaciated and dirty. The last look on her face was terrifying. I stared at the picture before pulling up her Facebook profile picture. In life she'd been attractive with a full round face and bright blue eyes. Her death photos were completely unrecognizable. Sunken eyes, bony face, even the hue of her eyes had faded. Her mouth was wide open as if she'd died mid-scream, and her glassy eyes were wide. Bethany's arms were up in a defensive posture, suggesting she'd been ready to fight, but died before she could mount a defense, thus giving her tormentor what he or she wanted. I'd previously skimmed the report, but figured it wouldn't hurt to go over it again. Bethany had been suffering from several nutritional deficiencies, which wasn't surprising based on her appearance. One thing that I hadn't noticed the first time I read the report was that her dress smelled of lavender and her hands had wax on them. I sent McAllister a text asking if he'd heard anything more about Bethany's death. Ten minutes later, my phone rang. Wilcox, I'm glad you called. Oh yeah? I was wondering about the wax on Bethany's hands. What's up? It was just simple candle wax. No idea where she got a candle from, in the desert. But forget about that. What you need to know is that Bethany was branded. Branded? Like cattle branding? Yep. A crude brand with the letters DF. Any idea what that might mean? I'm betting on divine fracture. Wow. I guess you were right. Something more is going on there. Bethany's death is still undetermined, but if she was branded. It makes me wonder if she really wanted to be out there. McAllister sounded tired. You're right to think that. I talked to Jebediah's old landlord. He was running a little prostitution ring out of the place he was renting. What? Yeah, this guy is dangerous. Now I'm sure Bethany was either starved to death or something like that. I also met with Jedediah Christensen's family. He's the leader of the Church of the Divine Fracture. We know Delaney was communicating with him. I think Bethany just tagged along. She had a history of drug use and committing crimes, but she probably was just looking for meaning at this point. Scary stuff. You need to be careful out there, Wilcox. Will do. I actually have a local come down to head into the desert with me. Good. Do not go alone. I'm not sure what's out there. I'm going to find out soon enough. The next morning, I was up early and eager to get out into the community. After getting dressed, I made coffee in the makeshift motel room coffee maker. Something out the window caught my eye as I was filling my cup. There was a man near my rental car. He was dressed in a black suit and wore large aviator sunglasses. I watched him lean over the front of the car and stick something under the windshield wiper before running to an idling Dodge minivan and drove off. He'd been parked on the opposite side of the parking lot, shielding his license plate from sight. I opened the door and scanned the area. No one else was around. The piece of paper stuck underneath the windshield flapped in the wind. I walked over to the car and unfolded the paper. It was written in neat, perfectly shaped cursive. If thy works are about the Lord, then thy thought will come to life. The Lord hath made the things of the world for himself, yea, the wicked of the day will pay. I read the note twice. It was gibberish, but it reminded me of a passage from Proverbs. It was similar but embellished, and the person who wrote it was trying and failing to use the king's English. There wasn't a citation or a reference to the Bible, but I understood the message. Whomever had left it wanted me to understand 
that I was interfering with something they deemed to be divinely inspired. I stuck the note in my pocket, headed back to the room, and slipped my Glock 43 into my ankle holster. Someone knew I was looking for Delaney. So far, I hadn't told anyone even Jebediah's former landlord, my name or purpose for being in town. A note on the windshield of a car usually meant someone was trying to call a bluff, but sometimes it was a warning because the criminal doesn't want to get violent, but will do so to protect their secret. I wasn't sure which was the case. Feeling a little anxious to be in a ground floor motel room, I packed up my computer and headed downtown. Main Street was bustling with students from the college and moms with strollers full of children. I spotted a coffee shop called The Clean Bean and decided to stop and engage the locals. A large banner boasting the fact that they had fresh roasted coffee hung from the door. The place was empty, except for a small pixie-like girl sitting at a bistro table with her legs crossed, staring off into the distance. She had light blue spiked hair and oval face and dark eyes. She didn't smile when I came in, but she had a welcoming air about her. Hey. What you drinking? Just looking for a good cup. Do you have a dark roast? Sadamo do you fine? Yeah. I love Sadamo. She moved behind the counter, dumped some beans into a grinder, filled a kettle with water, got it going, and set up a pour-over coffee jar. I'm Lacey. My sister and brother-in-law own this place. It's one of the few coffee shops in town. Nice to meet you. I'm Sylvia. What brings you to town, she asked nonchalantly. I'm here for work. What's work? I am a financial advisor, I said, creating a profession for myself on the fly. Why this town? The boss sent me here. Wrong stop. Do you know anything about this place? No, I said, making sure that my voice sounded naive and innocent. Well, here's the thing. This isn't a place where you can just come and set up shop. There are rules and reasons why people don't come here unless they have to. Seems like a nice town, I said, hoping Lacey would be eager to chat. It's okay, and I'm sure you've heard that this place is growing like the rest of the state. Probably not a whole lot to do around here, I said. It depends on what you're looking for. If you like the desert and mountains, you'll never be bored. If you're more into cities, like I am, life is not going to be very exciting. That's why I want to get out of here. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm from Salt Lake. My parents sent me down here to live with my sister when I stopped going to church. They thought my sis was going to get me back on the straight and narrow. Well, turns out that our dear Molly Mormon had become a coffee-guzzling granola. Surprise, right? Yeah, I'm sure that was a shock, I said, noticing how much a dividing line coffee was. So, outside of missing city life, are there other reasons why you don't like this town? Not really. It's nice for the most part. I just want to see the world and live life like a regular person, without everyone asking what ward I attend. Eager to stay away from bashing the dominant religion, I changed the subject. What do people do around here? They go to church, have church parties, and do church things. I laughed hoping that a playful but short giggle would alert Lacey that I didn't care about people being religious. No, really. What do people do here? My job is transferring me here, so this will be home soon. You can't go anywhere else? Nope. This is it. Hey, I heard a rumor that there were cults around here. Is that true? Her face changed from cynical to concerned. That's not a game around here. Should I be scared? I wouldn't say scared but cautious. Some groups can be violent. Yeah, I've heard that is the case. Didn't think it was true. It's definitely true. You need to just stay away from that element. So, you and your sister live here? I said, changing the subject. And my brother-in-law, along with their four kids. I'm 12 years younger than my sis, so she's almost like a mom to me. You guys own this shop? Well, Donna and Lawrence own it. I'm working to help out, and they pay me so that's nice too. Have you heard of the Church of the Divine Fracture? 
Lacey poured the coffee into a green mug and paused before handing me the cup before saying, Why are you asking about this? I read something about it online. Just trying to get a feel for things here. Listen, it's real and they don't play by any rules. Some people stake everything on it. Her eyes were wide with fear. The warning was sincere. Understood. I'm thinking about buying land out by Lund. Do you know anything about that area? Yes, and I recommend considering living within the city limits. This young girl was trying to give me good advice. She looked to be around 18, possibly 20, but she was mature for her age. Not into unnecessary risks. Okay. Thanks. Any recommendations on where I should live in the city? The best place would be close to the university, but not so close that you're living with students. You will get a mix of people there. Older college students and some of the exploring type. Rock climbers and hikers. Thanks. That's good to know. The other thing I would suggest is making this one of your stomping grounds. It's kind of a nice place for outsiders to hang out. Not just because we need more customers, we do, but because after work and on the weekends, we serve coffee, so that makes us a bit of a haven. So, people hang out here like they would in a bar? Kind of. It's like you need to find a crew, right? Okay. So the clean bean is the place to be. Obviously. I'm here, Lacey said, giggling like a schoolgirl. Well, I will definitely add this place to my Cedar City party file. Where are you from? Detroit. Whoa. Is that place as dangerous as they say? No, but the dangerous parts make a good show for news broadcasts. Good point. I like you. I'm glad you've chosen to move to our little city. So financial planning is your gig, huh? Sounds like big bucks. Not bad. I'm only a few years in. That's part of the reason why I'm moving here. I need to get my own practice going here. This might not be the best place for you. Everyone knows everyone here. That might make it hard to get clientele. Maybe that will help me. I'll stand out and be different. Might attract business. Lacey laughed, you are such an optimist. I like it. Thanks. So these groups that live out in the desert. What's the story there? I like four-wheeling and want to head out and explore. Is it safe? Yeah, that's fine. Just don't go by yourself. Take a friend and stay away from anything that looks like a settlement. People live out there, but they're on their own. Kind of outside of the mainstream. That means they have their own little justice system. They feed themselves, provide water for their families, and keep the gun cabinet stocked. Keep your distance. So the cults are real? Lacey nodded. Anything else I should know? The desert is beautiful, but dangerous. 16. After the coffee shop, I headed to the library and spent the next several hours learning about the geography of the surrounding area. The Escalante Desert was a parched stretch of land, seeing less than 15 inches of rain a year. Lund was set up as a pit stop town for trains, traveling between Salt Lake City and Los Angeles. I imagined that living in the area had always been harsh, and as soon as train travel declined, the town fell into a speedy decline. People that wanted to escape society could set up shop in the desert, or the mountains that headed to the Nevada state line, and no one would notice. It also would be hard for me to traverse those areas without a guide. There was no other way to find Delaney than to head into the desert and look. Feeling nervous and frustrated, I logged off the computer and headed back to the hotel. Martin called that late that afternoon with an update. How's Utah? Exciting and new. I filled Martin in on what I'd found out about Jebediah Bethany and the mysterious note on my windshield. Not very stealthy to place a note on someone's windshield in broad daylight. Unless you want the person to see you do it. Why would anyone want that? I'm here alone. Maybe they want me to know they have eyes and ears everywhere. Me, against a horde of people isn't going to work out well. True. You want me to come out? 
At this point, I definitely needed someone else with me, but since Brady would hopefully be on his way soon, I told Martin not to worry about coming out. You need someone that knows the place. What happened to that one guy? Brady? He's going to try to come down in the next few days. I really hope he's able to. Good. I hope so too. I've got some stuff to report on my end that might help narrow the search a bit. This financial planner dude is oversharing in the forum. I think he's a good person to talk with. I love oversharers. What's he been talking about? Well, he's constantly looking for information about how to introduce the ideas of the cult to his wife. I did some digging, and the bits and pieces he's dropped about himself indicate that he is most likely Reese Larson. Based on what he's spewing. So tell me more about this Reese guy. He goes on the forum to promote his financial services. He goes by the username Crypto King, but he posts the number to his office in the comments. A quick Google search pulled up his financial services business. He owns it, so unless one of his employees is hawking his office, it's Reese Larson. I opened my laptop and typed in his name, along with City Cedar. The first result was a sharply dressed man with blonde hair, enormous arms, and a crooked smile. He looked like a used car salesman. Okay. This guy's office is right on Main Street. How convenient. I think a visit is in order. I'll be there first thing tomorrow morning. Have you found out anything else? Yes. The theology these folks are pushing goes something like this. Jebediah can channel dead relatives and faith leaders from the past. He tells his followers that he's getting directives from these ancestors and leaders, and gives prophecies to the people. If you give enough money, you can get a private reading with Jebediah, and he will provide you with a window into your future. He seems to want to give these sessions to mostly women. How convenient. I could really use someone on the inside. What proof do you have that this crazy financial planner guy is the same as Reese Larson? There's a guy in the area that runs a financial planning agency named Reese Larson. His social media seems a little off. His posts are mostly about politics, but he mentions Lund a lot. He's always out exploring that particular area, which makes me wonder why he doesn't go elsewhere. It's pretty wide open around there, isn't it? You betcha. He could head to a new spot to explore daily and not run out of places to go. Give me a few examples of what you see in his social media posts. Mumbo jumbo about earthquakes and thunderstorms as apocalyptic events. Certain laws being the mark of the beast, and he seems to be really into dream analysis. He's running with a weird bunch. People pipe in and talk about how God saves them from things like missing sale prices at the grocery store. God working magic to make sure that they get to a restaurant minutes before it closes. I mean, things that are just everyday occurrences are made out to be divine intervention. It's hard to control myself. I want to tell them all to get help. That is extreme. I'm going to look up Reese and see if I can get an appointment. I'll tell him that I'm moving here and want to have someone here in town managing my money. Once I have enough information about his desire to be in the cult, I'm sure I can convince him to help me get to Delaney. Don't be afraid to throw in some crazy talk. That might get you into his circle. Good point. There's a storm moving in later this week. Maybe I'll throw out some type of prophecy about that. That will probably work. Just be careful. These people are not okay. How are things going at home? What else have you been up to? Mom thinks she might not want a divorce. Dad is considering whether he wants her back. It's a game. I know they will be back together in time. Well, I guess that's a good thing, right? Not really, but if it gets her out of my place, I'm all for it. Other than that, nothing's really happening here. Initially, I hadn't included Martin in the trip, but the more I thought about the expansive wilderness, the less confident I was that I could pull things off by myself. I was out of my element. I might need you to come out to Utah. Really? Yeah, 
I just want to get my bearings here and find out how extensive this operation is going to be. I'm ready. Nothing's happening until August for me. Thanks for being open. I will let you know. Cool. I'll send you some screenshots of the conversations the guy that first think is Reese has been having in the forum. Great. That'll help me prepare. Stay safe and I'll talk with you soon. The screenshots Martin sent were full of fear, anxiety, and illogical connections. Collective consciousness was the tool Reese claimed to have used to build his business, and he included an extensive explanation on his website. In between mystical musings was a mix of cute family photos, pictures of him posing and flexing his muscles, and religious and political rantings. Reese's eyes were bright and wide. His smile stretched across thin lips. Get the best. Ignore the rest. His headline read, I wrote down the office address and mapped out directions. After that, I reviewed Jebediah's address history again. Sometimes the algorithm throws names together because they lived under the same roof because it thinks the person is relative. But this time the only names were Jeb's siblings and parents. I typed in the address of the rental in Cedar City and scrolled through the results. Since it was a rental in a college town, the number of people who'd called the bungalow home was extensive. I scrolled through until I found a listening for a man named William Steen. His name caught my eye because he was listed as being 32. Based on the year that he'd lived at the rental, he'd been 29 when he moved it. It fit the profile of a renter who wasn't a student. I copied his name and did a search for more information. William Steen had several social media accounts and at one time, He'd been a prolific poster, and like many who share all their precious and mundane moments with the world, he hadn't enabled the majority of the security functions. He was tall and thin with hazel eyes. At one time he had curly shoulder-length hair, but as I zoomed in on his face, I recognized him as the man who had placed the note underneath my windshield. I looked through more of the photos and found a picture of William Steen and Reese Larson. I started looking for information on the different cults in the area. There wasn't anything official in terms of news coverage, but I did find a bare website with a poor layout for the Church of the Divine Fracture. The contact information was cryptic, with only an email address listed. Void of links or identifying information, the site didn't really evoke anything nefarious. In fact, after going through the few pages, it was completely innocuous. Boring and non-threatening, and yet somehow Delaney had fallen for Jebediah's spiel. I decided to send an email, inquiring about the group. I typed, hello. I would like to learn more about your church and hit send. A couple more clicks took me to Reese Larson's high school yearbook. A large spread showed him in a football uniform during homecoming. He also had a page of his own that detailed his plans for after high school. The girl standing next to him in one photo was a younger version of the woman from the picture on his website. A few more results revealed his resume, where I learned that he had served a mission in Mexico. He'd also worked as a financial planner for a national firm for two years before opening his own business. Plenty of things to talk about with Reese, I thought. My eyes were tired and it was getting late. I decided to turn in and get a fresh start the next day. It felt like I'd just drifted off to sleep, when my phone buzzed on the nightstand next to the bed. I'll be there before noon. It was Brady. Great. I'm going to drop in on a guy who has ties with Jebediah, so I might be there when you get here. I'll text you the address of the motel where I'm staying. Let's make a plan to meet for lunch at the Clean Bean on Main. Okay. See you soon. It was only half past six. The temptation to sleep for a few more hours passed once I remembered I would be meeting with Reese that morning. I needed to be ready, which meant adrenaline was my friend not sleep. I got up, threw on sweats and a t-shirt and went for a run. The red rock scenery made it hard to focus. My eyes kept wandering from the road where I was running, so I kept it short and was back at my room in half an hour. I showered, brewed a cup of coffee and put on a dark blue pantsuit and cream dress shirt. I stood in the mirror and began a familiar conversation with myself. Hi, 
I just moved to the area and I'd like to talk with you about options for my financial future, I said, practicing my spiel. You'll need a job. One that makes decent money. What's your career today? From what I'd read, the economy in Utah was great and the real estate market was red hot. Nice to meet you, Mr. Larson. I am a real estate agent. My name is Sarah Winters. He'd likely ask me why I was moving to Cedar City. I thought about my morning run. What brings me to Cedar City? Oh, I just love the red rock around here, and I want to be close to the national parks. It was cheaper to live here than in St. George, so here I am. I waited until 9.15 to head out. Ten minutes later, I pulled up in front of the bright yellow building that stood out like a sore thumb. The stucco and odd shape didn't fit in with the historic structures that occupied the rest of the block. I was surprised to find that Reese's office took up most of the first floor. The only other business was a title company. I opened the shiny glass door of Reese's office. Regardless of Reese's strange social media presence, his business must be doing well. The place was filled with upscale decor. A young woman bounced up from behind the front desk, smiling and giddy as she screeched, Well, hello? Welcome. My name is Kira. What brings you in today? I am in need of a financial planner. I'm in the process of moving to this area, and I want to get things in order as soon as possible. Oh, that's great. Where are you moving from? Michigan. Wow. That's quite a move. What brings you to this area? I'm a real estate agent. Utah is a hot market, and Michigan is a dead market. It's also beautiful here. Kira pulled a stack of forms from the counter and started jotting down information. Oh my gosh, you're going to love Cedar City. This place is perfect. It has everything you could ever want. My whole family lives here and we just absolutely couldn't imagine living anywhere else. So far, I can see that the place is stunningly beautiful, and everyone has been so friendly. That's Utah. We're wholesome and welcoming. Thanks for coming here. What's your name? Sylvia, I said, knowing enough about customer service etiquette that she wouldn't ask for a last name, yet. It's so great to meet you. Kira's level of excitement was a bit much. Her arms flailed in between pen strokes, and the short brown ponytail in the back of her head swung back and forth with each head gyration. I looked up this place and wanted to know if Mr. Larson had any room on his calendar this morning. She looked at the calendar. Um, he might be booked, but he has two other agents coming in at 10 and noon if you want to schedule with them. I smiled. Reese Larson was recommended to me by a close friend. If he's not available, I'll probably just go with one of the other recommendations. He's number one, but if I can't see him. Oh. You know what? I bet he can squeeze you in. He's in his office now. I'll get him, she said before bouncing away from the lobby and moving down a short hallway in what could only be referred to as a docile sprint. Reese Larson filled the hallway, towering over Kira's small frame. He looked tired but still managed to force a smile onto his face. He had a small sharp nose, a bronze artificial tan, and large blue eyes. His hair, blonde and thin, fell in loose curls, touching the collar of his. The blue shirt he wore was starched, giving it a cardboard look. The first three buttons of the shirt were undone, revealing the beginnings of a smooth, shaved chest. His biceps stretched the fabric of his shirt, and a ring of pooled sweat in his armpit was revealed when he reached out for a handshake. Hi, Sarah. So, I hear you looking for someone to manage your portfolio? Well, you've come to the right place. Reese Larson. Pleased to meet you. I put my hand in his and braced myself for the hard, jerking handshake I knew was coming. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. I am moving to Cedar City, and I'm looking for a financial planner who is local. Come on back to the office, Reese said, motioning for me to follow him. Cedar City is like no other place in the world. You're going to love it here. Where are you moving from? Michigan. Oh yeah, you're going to love this place. Slower go, but such a wonderful place to raise a family. Husband? 
deceased. Oh, oh. I'm so sorry. On the bright side, we do have a lot of eligible bachelors in this town, and we love getting married and having babies. But anyway, back to the planning. So, let's talk about some of your financial goals. Actually, before we do that, I want to let you know that we've got a ground floor opportunity. You can invest in an energy company that runs a few local potash mines. Since you're moving here, I'll give you a sweet deal on the buy-in. You can expect a 10% return year over year. That sounds interesting. Tell me more. I knew the scam well. The financial planner sat behind his desk explaining how he could help me get a 10% return on my money, year over year. I listened, nodded my head and arched my eyebrows at the appropriate times. Without asking if I had any questions, he whipped out a contract and showed me the different places I needed to sign. I continued to nod and crinkle my brow to show how interested I was. We've had great success with energy futures and real estate. Here's information about the companies you can invest in, Reese said, sliding a white folder across the desk to me. Thank you. So, I'm doing most of the talking. Let me shut up and let you tell me what you're interested in. I made sure that the folder was pulled tight to my chest before I said, what can you tell me about the Church of the Divine Fracture? Reese's cheeks turned red. I'm not sure I know what you're talking about. Come on, Reese. You don't want Julia to find out that you're considering moving the family to a cult in the desert the wrong way. Julia, who are you? What can you tell me about the Church of the Divine Fracture? I don't have much time. Start talking. He shook his head. I don't have any information about that. It's just something I saw online. What are you, FBI? That was a strange question. What was the Church of the Divine Fracture up to in the desert? Deciding to play my cards carefully, I said, tell me what I want to know and you won't have any problems. Reese pushed away from his desk and stood up. I am not in that church. I got to church here in town. Don't know what you're talking about. Are you planning on taking Julia to the little thing Jebediah is having in the desert? Is it a festival or a revival? Reese sat down and ran his hands through his hair. Okay. Here's the thing. I'm not a member of that church or whatever it is. Actually, we should call it a faith group or something like that. Anyway, I'm not a part of it for spiritual reasons. I just like a good message, you know? I go there for enlightenment. Have you heard about collective consciousness? There's like a common brain full of all the wisdom of the ages, and Jeb has tapped into it. Tapping into a higher power sounds like a church. I think he's just using that title to attract people. What he's actually talking about are the visions he has, community empowerment, living a good clean life, and making investments to shield yourself from the collapse of the government. He knows things that no normal person could know. So I just listen and learn. That's it. You should check out his message. It's all positive stuff. No guilt or punishment for natural impulses. Jeb is just getting messages from ancestors and source. He uses his powers to help people live their best lives. I'm just there to acquire knowledge and learn how to protect myself. Where does he hold these sessions? By Lund. There are some old structures out there that he's repurposed. It's free out there. No one's snooping around. He's building a fantastic setup, and it will be the only place that's safe when you won't believe it, so I'm not going to get into it. I'm listening. What is the point of this settlement? Something is right around the corner, and Jeb is going to lead the righteous. You have to be a part of the settlement before Source comes, or else you could be lost. We need to build the kingdom here on earth, and have it ready for the Savior. If we do that, we will live in paradise forever. When is this supposed to happen? Only Jebediah knows that. I'm looking for a woman named Delaney. Don't know her. How about a lady named Bethany? She was found dead in the desert right outside of Lund, where you say these meetings take place for the church that you say isn't a church. I told you. 
I just go for the lessons. A woman died. Her cause of death hasn't been determined yet, but the fact she was out there tells us that her demise was, let's just say, sped along. She was skin and bones, terrified look on her face, and an anonymous tip was used to report her location. Was that you, Reese? No way. I don't have anything to do with dead bodies. Okay, but someone does. Who knew about the body? I don't know. I don't have time to waste. What happened to Bethany? I swear. Think about Julia. I know someone told the police, but they did it in a roundabout way. Tells me they wanted to do the right thing, but they have their own secrets. If their dirt has nothing to do with Delaney or Bethany, I don't care. Do you understand? Reese sighed and ran his hands through his hair. There's someone that sets up shop around Lund. She lives by herself and doesn't bother anyone. I'm sure you already know her name is Clem, but she goes by Priscilla and if you could leave her alone, that would be great. I had no idea who Clem was, but Reese certainly thought I was familiar with that person. How long has Clem been living in the desert? He folded his hulking arms over his chest. She did the right thing. Got the message to the police. Why bother her? Don't you have some illegals or drug dealers to bust? What I have is one missing woman, and another one is dead. You tell me what I need to know, and you won't have to worry about anything. Same for Clem. I just want to know about Delaney Whitney and Bethany Price. Where can I find Clem? Around Lund. It's a big desert. Old Airstream trailer from the 1950s or 60s. Jeep Willys, real old but in good shape and a rusted out Ford. She has two dogs and she's an excellent shot, so proceed at your own risk. Delaney Whitby. Do you know her? No. Reese, remember what I said. I don't know her. The women are mostly separate. I really don't know any of them. So far, I've only been out there for the finance seminars. Jeb is trying to get everyone the info they need to be financially solvent and free from the system. Okay. Fair enough. I know that the revival is only a couple of days away, so I'm going to cut you some slack. Instead of stopping by to see Julia today, I'm going to go find Clem. If I find her and she tells me what I need to know, I might now have to come back here, but if things don't check out, I'll be back. To be on the safe side, before I see you again, you need to know a few basic things about Delaney. First, you need to know where she is located. Secondly, find out if she is healthy. And if you see her, tell her that Jeff is looking for her. Who is Jeff? I ask the questions. Not you. Follow these instructions, and you will be able to continue deceiving your wife and potential customers. I'm an honest. 10% guaranteed return. Well okay, so that based on. No Reese. That's not based on anything valid and you know it. I am a good man trying hard to provide for his family. I do good things for people. I'm not here to judge. I just need information and I hate lies. People should do their research and look for a fiduciary if they're going to use a financial planner, but in reality, it's just better to learn as much as you can yourself to manage finances. Wouldn't you agree? Not everyone has time to do that. Fair enough. Now let's get back to Bethany Price. You know anything about her? Nothing. Remember, Julia doesn't know your plan. You want her to find out the wrong way? This isn't fair. Most things aren't. What do you know about the body? Reside. There are people who live the desert. They don't bother anyone. I don't feel like being the person that puts a spotlight on them. It's not fair that people like you come snooping around. You won't get anything out of Clem. You really don't know what you're getting into. I'm trying to protect you. I guess we're done, I said standing up. Reese jumped out of his chair. Wait. Just give me a moment, okay? I eased back into the chair. Clem goes all over, but she's usually about 10 miles outside of Lund. 
You come to the silos and turn off the Lund Highway onto an old service road. She likes to be near the hot pots, so you'll have to look all around that area. She keeps moving. I can't say exactly where she'll be because I don't know. Thanks, I said, standing up to leave. And remember, I'll see you soon. Write me down for 9 o'clock the day after the revival. I'll be here at 8.30. I left Reese's office and headed to the clean bean. The place was moderately busy with 20-somethings perched throughout the place. I ordered a black coffee, a flavorful guji was the brew of the day, and headed to an oversized blue comfy chair in the back of the cafe. I started going through the information Reese had given me. There seemed to be a big push for people to invest in the potash mine, presumably, the same mine Jeff said Delaney had mentioned. Several charts that looked professional at first glance could clearly be identified as items that were completed on spreadsheets and printed off on laminated cardstock. I used my phone to search for the potash mine, but couldn't find any information. There were potash mines, but the one near Lund was listed as defunct. How many people followed up on what Reese told them? The real estate opportunities Reese had discussed were vague, but there were pictures of the desert, a runway and makeshift airport, and information about establishing a wilderness vacation spot. Intriguing idea, but it would be hard to convince people to pay for something they could easily get for free. From what I'd seen, the wilderness was vast, and while there were national and state parks, there also seemed to be plenty of wide open spaces where people could camp and enjoy uninhibited free land. My guess was that this was a shell game. Reese got investors to put up money for the mine or the wilderness plot. He used the money for his personal gain and hoped that they never asked to pull their money. He would have finally capitalized on the few real investments and made the money back. I pulled up Lund on my phone and looked at a satellite view of the abandoned town. It actually seemed to be a popular spot for exploration, and while there was officially zero population in the area, I could see the structures off in the distance. Brady called while I was looking at the satellite images of Lund. I just got off the highway. Where are you? I already made it to the clean bean. Come on up. I headed to the counter and got a cup of coffee for Brady. He showed up a few minutes later, sliding into the chair next to where I was sitting. Got you a coffee. Thanks. How was the meeting? Fruitful. I decided to just get to the point and ask him about the Church of the Divine Fracture. He tried to deny knowing anything about it, but when I threatened to tell his wife what was going on, he changed his tune. He also told me who found Bethany's body. That's good. Who are we looking for? Her name's Clem. Brady took a sip of his coffee, sat it down and titled his head. Clem. Ties to Tuila. I shrugged. Not sure. Is she on the run? Possibly. Reese assumed I knew who she was. He pulled out his phone and ran his fingers across the screen, typing a string of words into Google. Yep. I thought that was where I'd heard that name. You know who we're looking for? I think so. But we're not the only ones looking for Clem. He handed me his phone. Federal employee goes rogue burns down house. In recent months, Clementine Robertson's husband says that she has been acting paranoid and sacred. She felt like someone was after her, and when he gave her an ultimatum to get help, she burned down the house. Clem was normal and then she wasn't. It happened so fast. Harry Robertson said. His observations seemed to be accurate. Clem quit her job and started attending the meetings of a fringe group in the Tooele area. Now the FBI and local police are looking for her. So she's got a secret. A big one. She was a federal employee, so no telling what other reasons the law might want to get a hold of her. Might make her more likely to talk to us. Agreed. We also might be able to find the Church of the Divine Fracture location too. If Reese is familiar with her, I bet that means the group is close to areas where Clem usually hangs out. Where's the encampment? Close to Lund. There's a lot of land out there. Do you know where the hot pots are located? 
Which ones? There used to be a lot in this area. Some have dried up but there's still quite a few. He mentioned that Clem is usually about 10 miles outside of town. He said turn off the road at the silos. All right. We've got a landmark. What else did he tell you? Reese didn't give me a ton of information, but the main idea of the group is to prepare for Source, which is basically their deity, but it's just energy, to come to Earth. They are incorporating elements of various belief systems into a new faith created by Mr. Jebediah Christensen. We should head out there and see what we can see. I agree. Looks like a storm might be moving in at some point. If we leave now, we probably can beat it. 17. I drew a map of the silos and the Lund Highway. Based on Reese's directions, we'd need to turn off the highway and head 10 miles east of the silos. We decided to drive through Lund before looking for Clem. There was a chance the Church of the Divine Fracture was using the dilapidated structures in the ghost town. A heavy cloud hung a few miles beyond the town. I looked out across the emptiness, feeling a tinge of worry creeping into my mind. We'll need to get in and out before the storm moves in. If we're still out here when it rains, we might get caught in the clay, but don't worry. I've been in this situation before. The jeep won't make it out? Maybe, but probably not. The desert turns to mud when it gets soaked. The jeep will get stuck just like anything else, and we'll have to wait out the storm. I had no desire to spend the evening in Lund, but the desert was intriguing. What would we find if we drove out deeper into the void? The Lund Highway began in Cedar City, stretching out beyond the farms and eventually emptying out into the wilderness. The road was paved, presumably with the idea that this thoroughfare would one day become a main artery, but it was clear the highway wasn't traversed often. The sun was shining overhead, but an ominous gray sky was off in the distance. Unaccustomed to riding in a jeep, I was feeling a bit flustered by the wind whipping against my face. The vast emptiness and the hard bumps of the ride were foreign to me. The clouds aren't in front of us, so I think we'll be good for a while. Don't worry. I'm not worried. Your forehead is crinkled. You wouldn't know that if your eyes are on the road. Never been in a jeep? What is this, 20 questions? Brady laughed and mashed the accelerator. I've been out here a few times. My sister and I used to visit ghost towns together. This place was pretty well preserved the last time I was out here, but that was years ago. People would come out here and do drugs or squat around the place. We'll drive through Lund first. If we don't find anything, we'll head further beyond the railroad tracks. I nodded consumed with scenery. Utah's desert was harsh and full of secrets. The hard-packed, inhospitable terrain didn't yield much in the way of vegetation. Initially, I'd felt like I might not need anyone else to come with me into the desert, but as Brady and I approached Lund, I was glad I wasn't alone. I'd read about the area and looked up images, but nothing had prepared me for what it actually looked like. The town, which sprang up in the Escalante Valley after the railroad added a stop, had never had more than 200 residents. The harshness of the elements made it little more than a pit stop for those headed to California. Residents tried to set up farms but Lund didn't receive much rain, and the wind and hot temps killed the crops. All the farms failed, and according to the searches I'd conducted it was a ghost town, with a few exceptions. How many people live out here? Not sure. Probably more than we think. Some live in groups, but others are just out here living off-grid by themselves. We continued out of the ghost town. The vast expanse of the desert opened up before us, and the landscape before us looked bare, but about ten miles outside of Lund structures came into view. There are the silos, Brady said. All right. Into the unknown, we go. He turned off the main road. The jeep tackled the steep inclines and rocky terrain. It was a bumpy ride, but 20 minutes later, an Airstream Jeep Willys and a rusted-out F-150 came appeared. As we close in on the trailer, the door of the Airstream swung open and a woman with a rifle stepped out. I think we're about to meet Clem, I said. Be ready, Brady said, nodding at the glove box. I'm ready. 
she's not going to want to talk to us. No, she won't, but it will be better to talk to us than official law enforcement officers. Brady killed the engine. I stood up inside of the jeep. We don't mean you no harm. Just passing through. We need your help. I ain't got no help for nobody, she yelled back. Clem, I yelled. We just have a few questions. We're not police or federal agents. I heard about you from Reese Larson. She lowered her gun. Brady eased back behind the wheel of the jeep and drove closer. Two dogs came bounding out of the trailer, teeth bared. Bennett. Milo. Clem yelled, silencing the dogs. What do you want? Clem asked. You found a body a couple of months ago. I called from the jeep. I don't know what you're talking about. She has a family. Husband and kids. That ain't my problem. Nope. It isn't, but you cared enough to make sure she was found. That's risky. The police probably have been out here a few times. That's not good for someone like you, Clem. I climbed out of the jeep and walked towards Clem with my hands out by my sides. Just because I live a different life doesn't mean I don't know right from wrong. I know. That's why I'm here. They say that girl died of starvation or the elements. Maybe, but someone had her out here. Did you know she was branded? Clem turned away. She's from Michigan. Never been to the desert before. Something or someone lured her out here. How do you know she didn't come willingly? I think she did. I just don't think she knew what she was getting into. Clem motioned for me to come closer. You don't belong out here. Who are you? Someone who cares about right and wrong. Who is he? Clem asked, pointing at the jeep. Just my driver. Can we talk to you? You already talking. Clem had sun-bleached hair streaked with gray and a weather-worn face. She was fit and looked ready for battle. What have you seen out here? Too big of a question. Okay. I'm looking for a woman. Not the dead one, but her cousin. She'd got brown hair, thin, and she probably arrived about a week or two ago. I see lots of women. Out here. Where? This was a town once. There are structures. Some nights I see fires burning inside. In the ruins? Yep. It's a cheap and efficient way to live out here. Get a trailer to start. Even an RV can be a little too expensive to go that route. You just repurpose the stuff the world calls junk. Are there a lot of people out here? At night, there are quite a few. Mostly women. Some loudmouth preacher rules over them. He's using that area out there. Clem pointed off in the distance. Some people from the city come out to hear him speak. They call themselves a church, but they don't believe in what most churches do. Some mumble jumble about the loudmouth preacher being reincarnated. He claims to be able to tap into collective consciousness. According to him, he can read mind and everything. That's all I know. What happened the day you found Bethany? Nothing special. I was headed to the hot pots. I go there when I want a hot shower. Dip the water out and let it cool. So freeing out there where no one is looking. Do you go every day? No. Once a week. She wasn't here one week, but she was here the next. End of story. It was too short of an explanation. Clem's eyes were circling the desert, avoiding my gaze. She has a family. They want closure. Okay. Fine. There was a necklace or something scattered around her. I thought it was valuable, but when I got it back to the trailer, I saw something that made me throw it out. What did you see? It had some type of electronic parts. What was it? Don't know. I don't do electronics. Where did you throw it away? Threw it out of the window on my drive to, never mind where I was driving. What did this necklace look like? Fake diamonds. Some type of wiring. I wasn't sure what she was talking about but I imagined neither did she. Based on Clem's situation, 
I believe she had completely shunned technology. Have you heard any violent messages during the revivals? Clem nodded. Sometimes. This guy seems to be creating his own faith, but it mostly sounds like stuff you'd read in the Bible. He just adds in his own twists to things. Any examples you can think of? I remember hearing something about the leader's thoughts, always being righteous. We headed back through Lund. Rotting planks of dilapidated houses had collapsed into the dry, thirsty rocky ground. The wind whistled through the wide open spaces, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand up. The wind was howling through the skeletons of abandoned homes and businesses. Brady pulled the jeep near the train tracks and parked. Dust bloomed up behind us, covering the remnants of the road. Let's stop and take a look around. I wonder what made them think this would be a good place to settle. Man is always trying to conquer the land, Brady said, pulling his thick blonde hair into a ponytail at the nape of his neck. Out in the middle of nowhere, trains sat still and quiet, waiting for the next time they were called into service. It was an eerie scene, fit for a zombie movie. Ominous tendrils of dead trees curled up towards the sky, and debris, ripped and worn down by time and weather, littered the area. I wonder if they use this place for anything. It's possible. People use these ghost towns for drugs and squatting. There's also a lot of exploring. We need to keep our eyes open for private land signs. I've heard that a few people have bought parcels out here. There's even a small airport not too far away. I've been in this old house before. Let's head into this place and see what we see. Brady pointed at the little white house, surrounded by scrub brush and sandy rock-filled dirt, was in relatively good shape. All windows had been smashed and broken glass littered the floor, and the cloth of the loveseat had been weathered away. We made our way, careful and slow, through the remnants of the living room. Random pieces of furniture were covered in dust and remained in the house. Springs were exposed in a faded rose-colored love seat, weathered by the harsh desert winds. The ceiling was starting to bow in the middle, and graffiti artists had scrawled pictures and words on the side of the house. The name of a recent band was scrawled across the back wall in the kitchen, alerting us that recent visitors had been in the house. Okay, so we know that kids have been here recently. Do you think anyone else is using this area? Yeah. I think those trailers might belong to someone and be in use. My guess is that any group or off-gridders living out here have a main setup not too far from here. A few trailers sat in the field behind the house, laying on their sides, but in the distance I saw newer trailers. They looked to be in good shape, and I wondered if we'd be trespassing if we headed towards them. Why would they want to be close to this place? It's a dead town. Yeah but if you want to save on things, you can look for stuff to repurpose. Like you said, these people just got up and left. I'm sure there were some useful things here that were repurposed. I don't know, but I can tell that someone has been here recently. It's pretty secluded. This would also be a good place to discipline those that stray. Discipline? Are you thinking something like torture? Do you think that's in play? I think this guy has them brainwashed, but I doubt he's torturing them. What happens if they disobey? Just a thought. If he wanted to do something like that, this would be the place. I was going to brush off the idea, but the streak of blood on a piece of broken glass told me that Brady might be right. Okay, so torture might be on the menu. Look at this, I said, pointing at the window ledge. Hard to tell how recent that is, but yeah. That could be from an accident, or maybe something else. No way of knowing. Let's get a quick look at the trailers out there in the field. After that, we can take a drive. If we head into the desert now, we can get a good look around before it gets dark, Brady said. Okay, we'll check out the trailers and hit the road. Let's do it, Brady said, turning the key in the ignition. Three trailers sat in a triangle in the field behind the house. All were worn from dust and wind, and a quick peek in the windows didn't reveal much. All had dated decor, but none were worn or destroyed, which meant that they probably were placed in Lund within the last few years. We hadn't seen no trespassing signs, but unlike the older structures, no one had broken into the trailers. Maybe everyone in the area knew whom the trailers belonged to. Let's get away from here. 
Nothing's been touched, which makes me think this is private land. No sign, but you're right. We climbed into the jeep and headed down the dusty trail. Mountain Spring Road should take us up to an area where a mine is located. The girl in the coffee shop told me that the rumor is that they are about an hour outside of Lund, down Spring Mountain Road. I hope we can get her back before the snows come. Once that happens, we won't be able to make it through here. They'll close the pass. It's May. If I don't find Delaney in the next few weeks, I'll have to head back home. Yeah, but you're not a quitter. You'll get her back. Even if it takes more time than you've planned. How do you know that about me? It's pretty clear. Not hard to figure out. Brady was perceptive and easygoing. I could get used to being around this guy. I wasn't sure why he was putting himself in harm's way for my case, but I really appreciated having him by my side. Elevation increased, and the edges of our path fell away as we headed up the canyon road. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see the massive drop-off and thought that we must have been at least 6,000 feet above sea level. Patches of snow remained on the road from previous storms. We bumped along, hitting large holes and oversized rocks, holding on to the side handles as we bounced up and down. The bumpy ride caused my brow to crinkle, and his eyes squinted in a frustrated scowl. I wonder how much further this goes, I asked. Don't rightfully know, Brady responded. I read that the desert is only about 20 miles beyond the town so a little while longer. The land began to smooth out, and the mountains decreased in size, until we came to a point where the sandy clay of the desert started to take over the road. Sagebrush still lined the road, but the terrain was quickly turning into a golden field of sand. I think I see something, Brady said. I looked around on all sides, trying not to let the drop-offs turn my stomach. See that up there? It looks like a shanty town. Let's pull over and head in on foot. An outcropping of trailers and cars were cluttered amongst the sagebrush, with the occasional tree, many blown sideways by vicious winds and a number of signs. Well look at that, Brady said, pointing to a sign that said, Church of the Divine Fracture. What do you want to do here? Okay, but I want to be close. Let's check out that area by the trailers and storage containers. Brady sighed. I don't get to protect you, do I? Nope. P.I., remember? We parked on the side of the road and headed out to the trailers. The hard, sun-baked ground was solid underneath our feet. It felt like we were walking on cement that was interrupted by an occasional bushy shrub or two. Someone's been here recently, Brady said. Yeah. Tire tracks, I said as we approached the trailers. Let's take a quick peek into the trailers. We walked over to the travel trailers and peeked in. The tailors were full of junk but old furniture, clothes, and appliances. Probably just came by to check on things. So this is where... Wait. Did you hear that? Hear what? Brady asked. I think I heard something. Listen. Thump. Yeah. Definitely heard that. It's not coming from the trailers. I think it's the storage container. We both looked at the huge hunk of metal. I walked over, turned my back to the container, and kicked as hard as I could against the side using the sole of my shoe. A thump and a scream responded on the other side. Someone's in there, I said, rushing to the padlock door. Hey, can you hear me? A tortured scream penetrated the container, causing the hairs on my neck to stand up. I can get that off. I'll be back. Brady ran towards the jeep. Hold on. We're going to get you out. Yelps and screams continued. Brady returned a few minutes later with his toolbox. You're going to pick the lock. Nope. I'll do one better. He took out two wrenches, hooked them on opposite sides of the lock, flipped it upside down, placed his foot on the trailer and yanked the lock open. As I pulled open the door. A woman dressed in a long prairie dress fell out of the storage container. Her face had scratches and bruises, and she tripped over the long dress as she tried to scramble to her feet. Help me. Please help me. I tried to help her up, but she curled her fingers into claws and swatted me away. 
The woman fell and rushed through the scrub brush and sand on all fours. I ran after her. You're okay. We're going to get you out of here. The woman rushed away from me, and her painful yelps caused my heart to quicken. She grabbed swaths of her dress, holding it high above her ankles, running and falling as she progressed. Please help. Please, the woman panted. The woman went crashing to the ground again. This time I grabbed hold of her arm and kept her on the ground. Stop. We're going to help you. Our jeep is right over there. Okay. I said. Her battered face crumbled into tears. You're safe. Let's get to the jeep first. I've got one good arm. Let me help get her to the jeep, Brady said, catching up with us and lugging the toolbox in one hand. We balanced the thin woman between us and helped her to the jeep. She climbed inside, sat in the back and immediately started rocking back and forth. Brady and I looked at one another, acknowledging that she'd been traumatized. We're going to help you, okay? The woman continued rocking, her eyes staring far off into the distance. Let's get out of here, Brady said. The woman remained quiet in the back of the jeep during the drive. I gave her a bottle of water, which she sucked down in a few minutes. Do you need a doctor? I asked. No response. Is there some place we can take you? The woman continued to rock back and forth. Do you need the police? No police. Don't worry. We won't take you there. I have a hotel room. You can get cleaned up there, and we'll figure out what to do next. Is that okay? I wasn't sure, but it looked like she may have nodded. She confirmed her consent when she got out of the jeep at the motel and followed me to my room. What's your name? I asked. My question was met with a blank stare. You're safe. I promise I won't let anyone hurt you. She wrapped her arms around her waist. I'm Sylvia, and I'm looking for Delaney Whitby. I think she might be with a man named Jebediah. The woman's eyes lit up. How long were you out there? I don't know. We can't have phones or watches. Why were you in there? Punishment. I wasn't even bad she said before crumbling into a loud sob. Who put you in the container? Brady asked. I can't say. Is his name Jebediah? The woman ignored the question but went on to say, I'm lucky. You're safe now. Let's get inside. You can get cleaned up. We'll go get food and clothes for you. She hesitated, but eventually followed us into the motel. I booked the room across from mine for the woman. You know about us, the woman said once we were in the room. Yes. How? Delany's husband asked me to bring her home. Do you know her? Silence. Is she in trouble? Still nothing. Maybe we should head to the police. Delaney is listed as a missing person. You can tell them what you know. No. No. I'll talk. Just no police. Is Delaney safe? I don't know. But you know her? Yes. When was the last time you saw her? A few days ago. We tried to leave. Delaney wants to leave? Yes. Great. At least the trip had not been in vain. Now I just needed to find her. I'm Loretta. Can I have more water? Brady grabbed a water bottle from the small refrigerator in the corner of the room. Thank you, she said, taking the bottle. Nice to meet you, Loretta. So, you're a part of the same group as Delaney? We're not a group. We're chosen. Chosen for what? To pave the way for the Savior, Source. I nodded. What can you tell me about Source? He's connected to us. He is the Almighty. We are carrying out his plan here on Earth. Why did you want to leave? I asked. Loretta thought for a moment before saying, he got something wrong. What did he get wrong? If you don't know, I can't tell you, and I can't reveal his holy name. Jebediah Christensen? Loretta's eyes widened. Who are you? 
How do you know? Loretta, we need help getting a mother back to her children. Do you have children? Yes. Are they somewhere around Lund? Loretta burst into tears. Brady looked at me, his brow creased. Loretta, did you leave your family? He told me they would follow me. I had to be the strong one. How long have you lived out there? About a year. It was hard to live in the outside world. I'm from another group. I got kicked out after I got caught sneaking out to see a boy. Last year I found the Church of the Divine Fracture. It was different enough that I thought it would be good. I didn't have any money, but Jebediah took me in. Back then it was just the two of us. You and Jebediah? No. Me and Dora. We were the first two women to join, and he treated us well. As more wives came along, he became obsessed with money, and the ones that came with more money were treated better than those of us that came without any cash. In time, he started to have more issues with us. The beatings began after we started to run out of money. What can you tell me about Delaney? She's scared and wants to leave. Jebediah hasn't moved her to an atonement hole, but she was on the verge of being put in one. An atonement hole? Jebediah calls it a house. We call it a hole. That sounds like she is in danger. Maybe. What are Delaney's crimes? She started questioning Jebediah. She was pulling her old beliefs into things, and she misses her kids. We tried to run together. I don't know what he did to Delaney after that. Brady and I got Loretta settled in a room next to mine, before going to Walmart to buy her new clothes and picking up pizzas from a local parlor. When we returned she was still perched on the edge of the bed, the position she was in when we left her. I held out the pizza box, but Loretta didn't budge. Do you need anything? After giving her a few minutes to respond, I laid out the clothes next to her on the bed, sat the pizza box on the table and left. You think she'll be okay by herself? Brady asked. Not sure, but I don't know what else to do for her. She needs more help than I can provide. I have a friend in Michigan who helps women after they leave abusive situations. I'll give her. She might know of some organizations in the area that can help. Good plan. Let's eat. Initially, the dinner was awkward. We sat at the small table near the window with bottles of water and the pizza box between us. Brady pulled paper plates out of the bag and scooped pieces of pizza with a plastic fork. We ate in silence for a few minutes. Should we look for Loretta's family? Brady asked. That's a good question. Are you looking for her? Did she leave one bad situation for another? I don't know what to think at this point. The friend I told you about will hopefully have some suggestions. We don't know why Loretta was out there in the desert, or why she was in a storage container. I want to talk to her a little more in the morning, but then I think the best thing might be to take her to the police. We don't know what else is going on out there. Yeah, locking people in storage containers reeks of criminal activity. I wondered if she's like Delaney. If she has a husband and kids somewhere, I don't see how she could abandon them. Same here. Speaking of family, what's your story? The shift in conversation made me uncomfortable, but having Brady help me with this case had been instrumental in finding Loretta and navigating the desert. A short explanation of who I was wasn't unreasonable. Which one? You know what I mean. Attached? Unattached? Hoping for kids? Taken aback? I waited a moment before I answered. Well, I was one of those lucky souls who married my grade school crush. Derek was my best friend when I was a kid, and we ended up reconnecting as adults. We were both cops, a dream inspired by a shared tragedy from our childhood. Our marriage started out good. It was a fairy tale. Then it started to fall apart, and we separated. Just as we were getting back together, he was killed. That's tough. I'm sorry you went through that. It was tough. Now I just kind of throw myself into my work and make sure that Derek's brother is safe. What's your story? 
well there ain't much of a story to tell. I wrench my way through the days and like you, I just throw myself into work. Haven't found the right girl. She's going to need to love living in a junkyard, and that's a no-go for most ladies. A junkyard? Yep. That's pretty much what I have in my shop. It's contained so the neighbors don't complain. The other part of the story is that I fail to meet the height requirements for a lot of women. That's another reason for my lack of popularity. Oh, come on. My husband was about your height. Much to my dismay, girls loved him. Things must be different in your part of the world. Maybe. Speaking of which, thank you so much for your help. I thought I'd just tackle whatever came my way, but it really has been great to have you along for the ride. What made you decide to help me? Brady took a sip of his water and shrugged his shoulders. You came to my place. Said you needed help and I was able to help, so I'm here. What about work? I own the shop. The guys I have working for me are solid. I can trust them to take care of things for a short while. I really appreciate what you're doing. I'd be lost without you. Strong words that I couldn't take back. I instantly regretted the statement, but it was true. Hopefully, Brady took it the way I meant it. But how did I mean it? For a moment, I wondered if I wanted him to see more in the comment. It's nothing. Our eyes locked. Brady held my gaze for what felt like hours. I eventually looked away. So, what made you become a private investigator? The question brought me back to reality. My twin brother disappeared when I was ten. I was there when it happened. We were playing at the end of this dead-end street that was in front of a transfer station, and he vanished. There was all this overgrow, fruit trees, long grass, stuff like that. My brother Simon went in, and I didn't follow because I was sacred. That was the last time I saw him. I'm sorry, Brady said. I nodded. Thanks. Tomorrow we'll head back there, but we need to get up early and get Loretta settled. Better get to bed. I pushed the chair back from the table and stood up. Telling Simon's story always drained me. You're right. I'll see you in the morning. I put the rest of the pizza in the small refrigerator while Brady left. When he was gone, I walked over to the full-length mirror on the back of the bathroom door and smiled. Brady was nice. It had been a long time since I'd felt anything for a man, but he was so warm and easy to be with. But that was not on the agenda. No. That's not why you're here. Do the job and go home. 18. I was up and dressed by 7 the next morning. I called Martin and left a message about finding Loretta. After that, I called Madeline Price. What can I do for you, Mrs. Wilcox? Madeline Price didn't sound happy to hear from me. Our paths had crossed years before when I was investigating one of her acquaintances' death and I'd been forced to dig through the intensely private woman's life. Madeline. It's Sylvia Wilcox. Surely you know that I have your number saved, right? I'm crazy for answering, but I'm curious why you're calling me. I'm in Utah. Um, congrats on the vacation? She surprised me with a friendly chuckle. I'm just kidding. I know you better than that. What do you need? I'm here on a case. A bunch of women are being held in the desert, some in storage containers with padlocks on the doors. They're in a cult. Madeline was quiet. She was passionate about helping women and children get out of abusive situations. How many women? I don't know. A lot, I think. One of them was in a storage container. I got her out, but now I don't know what to do. Should I call the police? What did the woman tell you happened to her? If a crime has been committed, you probably should call the police. She didn't tell me much. I'm sure there are some crimes being committed, but I don't know that there is enough proof to bring the police in. The area where they're located it listed as a ghost town, but there are several residents. I think they're calling it a ghost town to keep people out. Yeah, there are a few polygamous setups out there. Be careful. 
They don't bother anyone, but they also don't like to be bothered. Makes sense. My hope is that I can get the woman I'm looking for out soon, so I can get home. Keep me posted. I'll look for places in Utah where the woman you rescued can get help. If things get bad, give me a call. I'll give you a hand. I checked my email and saw that I'd received a response from the Church of the Divine Fracture. Greetings. Thanks for reaching out. First, we want you to know that we are not a church in the traditional sense. We are a community focused on using collective consciousness to level up in life. What does level up mean? It means moving beyond the drudgery of day-to-day -day life and embracing a higher calling. Our services are private, but there are still opportunities to learn about our community. We would love to share our vision with you. We are having a revival soon. If you would like to know the time and location, contact JC. Short and sweet. The email for the enigmatic JC was listed at the bottom of the email. The most noticeable thing was that there wasn't an invitation to the church. Faith communities typically invite strangers to their services, but the Church of the Divine Fracture was inaccessible to the public. I looked at the time. It was only 7.30, but I was eager to talk to Loretta. I closed my laptop and headed to her room. Was it too early? Probably not. She'd been anxious. It was likely she'd been tossing and turning all night. I tapped on Loretta's door and waited. A few seconds passed. No answer. I knocked again, this time louder. Loretta. Is everything okay? I called through the door. I put my ear against the door. Silence. What if something had happened to Loretta? I rushed to the front desk. The clerk was tapping on her phone, a bored look on her face. Hi. I need help. If you need towels or a toothbrush. No. I need someone to check on the woman I booked a room for last night. I think she's missing. We can't really just go into someone's room. There's no moment. I need a welfare check now. The girl shrugged her shoulders, dropped her phone onto the counter, and headed to the back office. She came back with a key and motioned for me to follow her. We went to Loretta's room. The clerk knocked twice before using the keycard to open the door. The curtains were blowing gently in the wind of an open window. I rushed in. Loretta. Loretta, are you here? I checked the bathroom. Empty. I rushed past the clerk and headed to Brady's room. I nagged my fist against the door. Brady? She's gone. He pulled open the door. Loretta is gone. What? We need to find her. You think she went back? I don't know how she'd get there, but we have to check. We headed back to where we'd seen Clem, but she wasn't parked there. Heading back through Lund and traversing the other side of the ghost town, the jeep sped over the sand, kicking up dust. I think I see her up there, Brady said. Clem was outside of the trailer with the dogs. I don't take company on a regular basis. Clem said as we parked next to her willies. Clem, we need your help. Again. Yes. Please. There was a woman. Red hair, dirty dress, very thin. Have you seen her? Clem was cooking a steak for breakfast. She flipped the meat and said, I saw you at the storage containers. You did? Yep. I wasn't the only one. There are eyes everywhere. And you have to remember that these women want to come here. They don't know what they're getting into, but they come here and even the ones that tell you they want to leave are conflicted. Clem cut off two pieces of the steak and tossed them at her dogs. Yes. I've seen her. Yes, she's back. I saw the leader bring her in this morning. No fussing or fighting. She just went back into the storage container. I looked at Brady. He shrugged. Listen here, Missy. This is how things are out here. You're playing with fire. There have been trucks coming and going lately. There are a few companies out here, but they don't have that much traffic. That preacher has something big going on. Best not to mess with him. 
We're getting Loretta back, I said. You can't stop what's happening here. I'm not letting this go on. Brady, let's go back to that storage container. He held up his hands. I know you're upset, but we can't let emotions take over. Going to the storage containers right now is a bad idea. We need to go back and make a plan, Brady said. He's right. Clem said. This man has a hold on them. We need to regroup. They were right. I was frustrated and ready to bring the case to an end. I also was upset that I'd left Loretta alone. Initially, I was going to have her stay in my room, but I wanted to give her some privacy. She'd been through a traumatic situation. Big mistake. We need to find out where the revival is going to be held. In Lund proper, Clem said. They have the revivals in Lund? Yep. Right near the trailers we saw the last time. They set up a bunch of chairs under a tent and a makeshift stage. We need to go. Brady shook his head. You're going to want to stay away. Let me get the information. We should contact that financial planner guy. Maybe he can get me in. Okay, but I want to be close, just in case something happens. Brady sighed. I don't get to protect you, do I? Nope. P.I., remember? I'm thinking we get a look at what's going on, before we head in. When we head in, it'll just be me. No, that's not a good plan. I'll head in. Say I'm lost or something like that. You're going to stick out like a sore thumb. Brady was right. I was definitely in the wrong part of town. I'm going to head in. You stay here, Brady said before popping open the glove box and slipping one of the guns into his holster. I sat in the jeep, taking in the scenery. It wasn't as remote as I'd imagined it would be. The road was by no means bustling, but there was a steady stream of traffic that consisted of ATVs, horses, and trucks. The area was picturesque and interesting, with so many small dirt trails to explore. I'd expected the settlement to be in the middle of nowhere, but it turned out that Jebediah's place was not too far from civilization. The settlement of the Church of the Divine Fracture was just a few minutes beyond Lund. Brady returned, just as I started to consider going in and making sure he was okay. I don't think Jebediah is there, but I did meet a lot of women all dressed in prairie dresses, they came scrambling up to me. Some of them looked desperate. Did they introduce themselves? Yeah. No Delaney, but I met Sarah, Lena, Rosa, and a few more. I can't remember, Brady said, pulling back onto the narrow dirt road. What did they say? They wanted to know if I was named Peter. Why? Apparently, they've been told he's coming back soon to help usher in whatever they think is going to happen. The revival. That's great. I mean, you have to get back, right? Brady was quiet for a minute. I'm not going to leave it all to you. I can stay a while longer. 19. We made it to Reese's office around 9.15. He was bent over a desk calendar on his assistant's desk when we walked in. What are you doing here? Reese asked, beads of sweat already sitting on his forehead. This is my friend Brady. He's going to come along to the worship service with you tonight. No. Some strange guy isn't going to go over well. I'm ready to learn all about your church, Brady said. Reese looked at Brady. His eyes were enormous and confused. Who the heck are you? A new friend? Brady let out a chuckle. I was enjoying how disturbed Reese looked at the thought of Brady going to the revival with him. I don't know anything about what you want to know. I told you I'd just go for the positive message. You've been out there since the last time we spoke. What did you see? I asked. Reese fell back in his chair. It's not what you think. Julia probably thinks you're in some business meeting when you go out there, doesn't she? Leave my wife out of this. Listen, everyone wants to be there. It's not your business if people have different beliefs than what you deem appropriate. What about Loretta? How do you, never mind. Here's the deal with Loretta. 
she's crazy, doesn't know what she wants, and now she's upset and causing trouble. If you know Loretta, you know Delaney. Is she going to be there tonight? I'm a good man. Why are you doing this? Answer the question, Reese. I think she might be there, but she won't be speaking. And why is that? I don't know. Women can be fickle. Especially when they're in an abusive relationship. Fearing for one's life can lead to indecision. You're putting words in my mouth. Don't think I'm some type of monster. Brother Jebediah has to tend his own house the way he sees fit. Including beating women? He doesn't do that. He's special. Is he? Brady said. Reese nodded his head. Things are more complicated than you can comprehend. Like a 10% return on a phony mine? I said, referencing the fake investment Reese tried to sell to me. We're working on getting the mine up and running. But it's closed at this point, right? You need the money to get started, but you're selling it as something people will see a return from immediately. Planning for the future. All investors will get their money back, and then some. Sure. Anyway, here's the plan. You're going to sit next to Brady tonight. At some point, you need to find Delaney and give her a note. I don't know this woman. Well, make a friend tonight. Do whatever you have to do to get the note to her. We used the rest of the afternoon to plan how we were going to get Delaney out of the compound. The hope was that Loretta had told the truth about Delaney wanting to leave. I'm going to head in. You stay here, Brady said before popping open the glove box and slipping one of the guns into his holster. I sat in the jeep, taking in the scenery. It wasn't as remote as I'd imagined it would be. The road was by no means bustling, but there was a steady stream of traffic that consisted of ATVs, horses, and trucks. The area was picturesque and interesting, with so many small dirt trails to explore. I'd expected the settlement to be in the middle of nowhere, but it turned out that Jebediah's place was not too far from civilization. The settlement of the Church of the Divine Fracture was just a few minutes beyond Lund. I went to the window and peered across the desert. A few people were standing around, waiting for the sermon to begin. At five o'clock the crowd began gravitating toward the folding chairs. I didn't see anyone that looked like Delaney. Reese and Brady were standing together near the stage. Ten minutes after five, the revival got underway. The first part of the service included members, who headed to the makeshift pulpit and confessed their allegiance to Jebediah Christensen. The first woman waddled up to the microphone, her belly bulging, making it difficult for her to climb the stout steps that led to the top of the stage. Her hair, braided and flowing down her back, was limp and dull. A train of women stood behind her, waiting to proclaim their certainty that Jebediah was in contact with Source. Brady was able to stay in the back of the meeting and listen to the sermon. After the women, two men testified. The audio was muffled, but I was able to make out what was being said. The government wants to take our money and control our lives. They want to stop us from living a righteous and true life according to the laws of the Lord. We will not allow them to stop us from ushering the greatest glory of the world. The crowd clapped and cheered. Two more women followed, giving speeches that were similar to the first one. Then a man with thick wavy hair and piercing brown eyes took the stage. His back was straight, and he held his head exceptionally high. The crowd was still and silent. A light wind blew his shoulder-length hair around his head, creating a loose halo. Brothers and sisters, time is running out. We need to be ready for the second coming. When it happens, we must be ready for the next step. There won't be time for us to prepare once the heavens open and the calamities have started. The city must be built, and it must be sustainable and ready to house those who are worthy. When the seven seals open in the sky, will you be ready? Think about what is happening. We are fallen, and the only way to get to the other side is to repent and prepare for the Lord's rescue. Beauty will come, but it must be fought for. We will not reap the joys of salvation if we fail to heed these plain and precious truths. I've seen what will happen to the others. 
it will be devastating, but if we follow and obey, our souls will be spared. It's almost time for us to rise up and conquer, and take our rightful place in the world. If we do this right, we will all be able to tap into the collective consciousness, and we will be born again through our minds. You will be a higher being than those we walk amongst, and we will right the wrongs of the world. But you must follow what Anna is telling us, she can see from the other side, she can direct us, she will lead us to the right place, but I am the only one who has access to her, so it makes sense that she would listen to me. When you ask about where your investment has gone, you have to know it is going to building the future. We will need to care for the world. We will be the leaders. You will have a rightful place in my kingdom. Your investment will pay off those of you who have come abroad with you, a one-time investment in the Church of the Divine Fracture. You will be rewarded by asking yourself who is happier than us living here, amongst nature, taking care of each other, being self-reliant. No one is as happy as us. A sigh of relief rose from the crowd. Some people were on the edge of their folding chairs, waiting anxiously for the next word. Others had creased brows and folded arms. Regardless of the reactions, it seemed everyone was affected in some way by this message. What will become of those who do not listen to the Lord's prophet? They will suffer. They will not have mercy. No one will save them. This is the path and now is the time. The decision to follow the righteous path or continue to be a wanderer or a member of the church is nothing more than the whore of Babylon. Brother, can we take some time to ponder these points? A man yelled out. What more proof do you need? A woman asked. How do we know that this is the truth? Doubt is your choice to embrace it if you choose. But I encourage you to take a moment to get in touch with your feelings, friends. What do you feel? Is your heart beating fast? Reach inside. What do you feel? I watched individuals, engrossed in the message Jebediah had given them. Wives and husbands looked at one another. People whispered and shrugged their shoulders. If you lack the power to act on the knowledge now, be reminded that time is running short. You will not be permitted if you don't heed my words, Jebediah said, his long wavy dark hair ominously blowing around the edges of his face. His eyes were wide and fierce. You can follow me, or you can damn yourself to a place of great weeping and wailing, and pure misery. I am the light. The choice is yours. Jebediah took a dramatic step forward and looked around the crowd. He stood still on the stage for an uncomfortable amount of time. Then his body jolted and he screamed. This is your last chance. Gasps and yelps escaped from the mouths of the frightened crowd. I stumbled backward, taken aback by Jebediah's thundering voice. One man followed by another and another stood up and formed a line. A tired-looking woman in a dirty prairie dress hobbled to the back row of chairs. I adjusted the binoculars. Was that Delaney? No price is too much for salvation. The Lord needs you now. Will you answer the call? Jebediah spoke quietly as the line filed past the stage. Each person dropped money in the basket. Jebediah's speech hadn't been impressive, thorough, or convincing. It was a show, and they fell for it. Reese dropped a few dollars in the basket and started heading for his car. Brady, who was right behind him, did the same. The women began folding up chairs and taking down the stage while the men chatted. I watched Reese and Brady pull off and head down the Lund Highway. An hour later, after everyone else had left the revival site, Brady showed up at the abandoned house. Oh my gosh, I can't believe people are buying into his crap. Well, he's got a good strategy. I talked to a few people before it got started, and it's a commune of sorts. All money is held in a group fund and managed by Jebediah. So, regardless of how much you've previously given, you're out if you can't provide monetary support for the community? That's right. How does it work for women? They're pretty much property of the men, so they just have to come with what amounts to a dowry. What about work? That's the other thing. The women and children work building houses all day long. The few men involved in the group head into town and work. Did they line up because they believe what he says? Or because they didn't want to stand out? Both. That's the game. 
You believe because you're told it's true, and because everyone else believes it as well. A self-fulfilling prophecy. Yep. That's the way it works. There were close to a hundred people there. Ninety-seven, to be exact. Even if everyone is only giving five bucks, he'll have a good haul. I bet many of them are giving more than that. I'm sure. I think Reese gave Delaney the note. Okay. We better get going. 20. The next evening, we put the plan in motion. The note Reese gave to Delaney instructed her to get outside the compound at 7 o'clock, giving us enough time to get down the mountain before it was dark. We arrived at 6.25, parking about a quarter mile away from the entrance. You think she's coming? Don't know. I hope so. Of course, we don't even know if she got the note. I think she did. If she doesn't show, I think she just has decided to stay. We'll see. The desert was quiet and calm. A light breeze blew through the scrub brush, but that was the extent of movement. Seven o'clock came and went without any sign of Delaney. It's 7.10, Brady said, showing me his phone. I know. Let's just give her ten more minutes. After that, we'll leave. She was in a cult. There was a chance she was having trouble getting away. Someone's coming, Brady said down the road. I looked through my binoculars. The woman looked worn and tired, and her face was smeared with dirt, but it was Delaney. That's her. Okay. I'm going to grab her. Stay here. I rushed out of the jeep. Delaney. We ran toward one another. Then she stopped and looked around as if she was lost. Delaney. We have to get going. The sun's setting soon. I, I don't know if I can leave. Knowing that we didn't have much time, I said, tell me about it in the jeep. I reached for her hand. She pulled back. We don't have time for this. We need to go. Delaney's face was weathered from the time she'd spent in the harsh desert. I wasn't sure what to say to get her to come back. I don't know. What if Source comes and I'm not here? My whole family will be lost. What about Jeff and the kids? I didn't know how to argue against a fake deity. I'm doing this for them. I've paid our way. They will be able to come when Source arrives, because I invested in the kingdom. Do you love Jeff and the kids? Yes then you don't want them to hurt. They are lost without you. No. I don't want them to hurt, but the truth will be revealed soon, and if I leave, we will all be lost. She stepped back further. It looked like she wasn't going to leave with us. Frustration rose in my throat. May I call and let Jeff know that I've found you? You're going to tell him, anyway. I gave her a knowing look. Isn't it only fair to let him know? He's been worried sick since Bethany was found. Delaney covered her mouth with her hand. Her eyes glazed over. Had she not known? Bethany was found dead near the hot pots. She was skin and bones. It looked like she'd been starved. She also was branded. She bent over let out a loud sob. This was getting dangerous. Someone was going to hear her. It's now or never. You lie, she screamed. Delaney. Bethany is being punished for disobeying, but she will be back as soon as she remembers why we are here. You lie to take away my salvation. We better roll, Brady said. I think I see someone coming from the compound. Last chance, Delaney. I held out my hand to her. She took a swipe at my hand with her fist. That was it. She wasn't coming with us. Great. I will tell Jeff I found you and that you're alive. I hope Loretta is still alive. Loretta. Delany's voice was suddenly faint. Yes. We found her locked in a storage container in Lund. Delaney stopped walking and said she was bad too. Delaney, it's now or never, I said, heading back towards the jeep. Are you leaving? Yes. I'm heading back to Michigan. Wait. Can you wait for a few days? Her eyes were wide. 
Why would I wait a few days? Because I might want to go with you. It's now or never. There is no time to be indecisive. I have to think about it. Think about it. Jeff is your husband. You either love him or you don't. I was married to my best friend. There were issues and at one point we split, but just as we were coming to our senses and moving forward together, he died. Now I'll never get that chance, and I always wonder what would have happened if we'd stayed together. If we'd never had that temporary separation. Or what if we'd spent the whole six years together? Delaney shook her head as tears spilled out of her eyes. I can't leave without Bethany. I have to wait until she can leave, too. Bethany is back in Michigan. She's awaiting burial. I'll make it simple for you. I'm leaving right now. If you follow me back to the Jeep, we'll get you out of here and take you back to your family. I'll be with you the entire way. If you aren't behind me when I get to the Jeep, I'm leaving. I watched her eyes dart around the desert before turning to leave. The temptation to look back was strong, but I resisted, walking straight to the jeep, opening the door and climbing in. She's not behind me, is she? I asked Brady. He shook his head. What are we going to do now? We leave. I gave her the ultimatum. She knows what this means. Are you sure? Go, I said. Maybe if. Brady, go. He hesitated for a second but we were on the Lund Highway within a few minutes, headed back to Cedar City. How are you going to break it to the husband? I had no idea how I was going to tell him that his wife had officially chosen to stay with a cult. Don't know, but it won't be over the phone. I have to go back to Michigan. You're leaving? Brady's eyes widened. The case hasn't gone well. Delaney has made her choice, so I'm headed back to... Michigan. The last word got stuck in my throat. Guess you have to go back. We had become friends. It would be sad to say goodbye. The case is over. I'm going to book a flight home. 21. Exhausted and disappointed, I said goodnight to Brady before we got out of the Jeep. I could tell he was unhappy our time together was ending, so was I, but I needed to call Madeline and Martin. Delaney wanted to leave, and she was clearly unstable based on her severe mood swings. It was two hours later in Michigan, but I decided it was urgent enough to call Madeline. She didn't answer, but called me back as soon as I disconnected the call. She refused to leave. What happened? Tell me everything. I relayed the story to Madeline. Okay. This isn't that uncommon. And you say the cousin died out there? Yes. How did Delaney look? Dirty, but not emaciated. Still, if one woman is dead, there might be more in dire states. Where are you again? Cedar City, Utah. I heard Madeline's fingers pecking away on a keyboard. You'll need two drivers. Okay. I can do that. I can be there tomorrow evening. The women are in Lund. It's a ghost town. The nearest city is Cedar City. How many women? I honestly don't know. Twenty or so that I know of. Twenty? Are they all ready to leave? Probably not. How many are you officially there to get out? Officially, one. What have you done to get her out so far? We got a note to her, and she came to the pickup point, but she wouldn't come with us. If she met you at the pickup point, she wants to leave. I can come to Utah. I didn't know what to say. I didn't even have to convince her. I need to know how to orchestrate the getaway, I said. First, make sure she's serious, which it sounds like she is. You'll have to supply a driver and no, it can't be you. Why? Because you're the decoy car. You're going to drive back on the road most traveled through Colorado, and the victim will be taking the road less traveled, the longer route through Wyoming. Don't you have a crew? I can pay for their services. It's not about money. 
My people don't want to be known. They're private and I'm not using them for this. I'll help, but you're going to have to supply some support people. I thought about Brady and Martin. Okay. I've got two guys. Perfect. You'll need someone to ride with you. Madeline was a professional. She relied on others for their assistance, and last I checked, she and her crew had rescued over 60 women. Besides, I didn't know if I would be able to get Delaney out by myself. When can you come out? I'm going to have to check a few things, but soon. One more question. Is it wrong to try to help someone who doesn't want to be helped? Well, it depends. Is there evidence the woman has been brainwashed? I don't know. Delaney was willing to talk with me, so that tells me she obviously has some doubts. I'm an outsider. If she was so dedicated, there's no way that she would have talked with me. Maybe she feels forced. If she believes that this is the only way to gain salvation, she might be afraid to leave, but she met you for pickup, so she wants to leave. You just have to be tough. Make it urgent. Madeline told me she'd call me back the next morning with details. I called Martin after we got off the phone. I've got a flight booked. I'll be landing early in the morning. Okay. I'm going to head downtown and book a room. Call me as soon as you land. I headed to Brady's room. There was a little flutter in my stomach. Focus Wilcox, focus, I told myself. This isn't the time for you to have a crush. Brady opened the door and said, You okay? What happened? I'm not leaving yet. There's one more thing I want to try. Okay. What's the plan? My assistant, my brother-in-law, well, former brother-in-law, I guess, and someone who works these kinds of case are coming out to help. Madeline will be here tomorrow, and she'll fill us in on the plan. All right. We better get some rest. If you're sticking around, you must be confident this lady can get her out. Absolutely confident that Madeline will get Delaney out, I said. My hope was I'd believe that statement by the time Madeline and Martin arrived. Madeline's flight landed at noon, and Martin was in town by 2.30. I thought they'd both rent vehicles and drive up, but Madeline said she'd wait for Martin. I want a certain vehicle, and the moment we get this lady, we're hitting the road. She told me after arriving in St. George. They arrived in Cedar City at 40.30. Brady and I were ready to spring into action. Since Madeline had done this dozens of times before, the three of us waited for her instructions. Sylvia and Brady, check out of your motel rooms. It'll be the first place they check. I thought about the note William Steen had left on my windshield and nodded my head. They knew where I was. After that, check in another motel near Lund. We won't be staying the night, but we need a base camp for the next couple of hours. Madeline said, Look for a place that rents by the hour. If possible, find one that takes cash. No one takes cash anymore. Martin said. They do. You just have to offer it to the right person. This thing needs to happen fast, and if Delaney is unwilling, we have to leave her. We don't know what the consequences will be if we get caught trying to remove her, so let's not find out. We're doing the pickup just outside of Lund, in a wash. You talk to your guy on the inside? Madeline asked. I nodded. Yes. Reese will bring Delaney to the desert and drop her off. You trust that guy? Martin asked. No, but I trust that he doesn't want my telling his wife what he's been up to. Madeline continued without missing a beat. Sylvia and I will be there to receive Delaney. Boys, you're the drivers, so pay attention to what's going on. We might have to talk with her for a few moments, but this needs to be quick. She needs to get into the van, which Martin is driving. Brady, you will be in the Jeep. This is important, because we need you guys to lead any potential usurpers on a wild goose chase. Don't look back. Just take whatever trails lead away from the main roads that you can get to. I know plenty of them, Brady said. Great. The hope is that Delaney just gets into the van. If she doesn't, Sylvia, we're cutting off the communication after three minutes. At that point, 
we'll just tell her to get in the van, or we're leaving her in the desert. We need to be careful as well. Everyone needs protection. Keep your eyes open. There are some other groups out in the desert. Anti-government groups, and random hodgepodge sovereign citizens and people that really don't want anyone to know they're present. We need to steer clear of them. There's no real cover out there except for dilapidated buildings. Right? So we wait until Reese gets to the wash. If someone is watching, they're going to see us, so we can't worry about that too much. Just be ready if something happens. What does it mean to be ready? Martin asked. It means that you'll be in a desert. If threatened, be ready to defend yourself. You're armed, right? Yes. Don't hesitate. Is she telling us to kill people? Martin whispered loudly. No. She's telling you to be smart. I said. Does that including killing people? Is he going to be a problem? Madeline asked, her voice filled with frustration. Never. I trust Martin with my life, I said. Great, but it's me that has to trust him. You'll be riding around with your cowboy. Brady shook his head and laughed. Okay. We've got a few hours before this goes down. Make sure that you're properly watered and fed, but there won't be bathroom breaks, so don't overdo it.